White Coolies, a true story of Australian women at war, adapted from the diary written in a Japanese prison camp by Sister Betty Jeffrey. Dedicated to those nurses who did not return. Sister Davis. Missing. Sister Hempstead. Missing. Sister Garden. Missing. Sister Raymond. Missing. Sister Jeffrey. Here. Gardening is in full swing now. The whole inside of the camp, and the outside too, has been chunkled into gardens of sweet potatoes and tapioca. Even the roadside and lawns and private houses in the district around us have been turned into potato patches by our efforts. It's amazing how good we are at government stroke. And unless the guards are watching carefully, we have a trick or two that rests our weary backs and arms. Hey, Woody, where's the guard? Not in sight, Dale. Now's our chance. Jump into the row behind. Mm, what for? Oh, it's been hoed, stupid. Mm. Now, when the guard comes along, look as if you're working hard. Oh, what a wonderful idea, Dale. Mm, my back. I swear this chunk will weighs more than I do. It feels like it. Look out. Here comes the guard. Now look as if you're hoeing like mad. Oh, it's nasty little Ito. He's a little horror. Get on with it. Get on with it. You there. You are too slow. See that you turn the earth over and break it. Yeah, I'd like to break your rotten little head. You are sky. Show me hands. Uh-uh, here comes trouble. Show my hands? What for? Never mind. Show hands. Oh, well. There. Ten palms up. Hey, what is this? You are not working hard enough. You have no bristles. My hands are tough and they won't blister now. You work hard enough, they blister. Oh. You will come over here to this place. I will show you how to work properly. Oh, dear. That's as hard as rocks. You are the Ross guy. We come too. But I've got blisters. You will get more. Now, work here while I stand by and watch. Yeah, I'd like to blister you, you little bastard. No talking. Work. Another day nearly over. There doesn't seem to be anywhere left for us to work. <coughs> oh, I'm so stiff. Oh, you'd think having done this for so long, as stiff as it go. You know, I don't think it's stiffness, Viv. I think it's bones and muscles grinding together. There's no flesh between them. Well, it looks very neat, really, all these little furrows. Oh, here comes Ito now. I hope it's to tell us we can go home. <sighs> Seedlings with him. What have they got? Bundles of something. You are to start planting now. I'm... But we've finished our day's work. You had me. Take these sweet potato cuttings. Plant them at once and water them. Water them? That means carrying water. Start at once. One of you lay them along for her. The other press them into earth. They all have to be planted by tonight. I don't think my back will stand the strain. You have been roping. You have not enough bristles. This is easy work. Now get on with it. Come on, Jeff. You place them and I'll plant them. So we worked on. And by the time all those plants were in, 
Our backs were nearly broken. The Japs promise us potatoes in three months. Maybe. There may be potatoes in the vines in three months, but we'll be very surprised if we get any of them. The following days, we planted tapioca. We cut eight-inch cuttings from the stalk of the fully grown plant and push it into the ground at an angle. Leaves appear in two days. Even now, Ito is desperate for places to work in, so he's thought up new ways to give us blisters on our blisters. Well, now that everything is dug and planted within sight, what else can dear little Ito think up for us to do? Haven't you heard the latest? No, Dale. Go on, tell me the worst. We have to weed the roads and street drains. Now, that'll be nice. The drains are as deep as ditches and overgrown and filthy. What do they think we do this work on? Nobody has any energy at all these days except that bit kept to do our own chores. Uh, and they're getting more difficult every day. I dread washing up. Sylvia Muir, Tweedy and I are at it from 5.30 a.m. till 6 p.m. on our day, mm. which is one in three. We still have to find the energy and time to try and earn a living. <sighs> the thing that's hardest to bear, I think, Jeff, is this lack of water. Oh, if only it would rain. Well, I don't know what's going to happen in another couple of days. Wells are almost dry now. Trying to get by on the rations of a five-pound butter tin per person per day is no fun. Next war, I'm going to set off at once for the South Pole with plenty of clothes and some sugar. (laughs) But the water needn't be so bad if only the nips had turned the tap on. All their wonderful promises of something good coming to us and Charlie Chaplin's it can't be worse. Poor, pathetic us. We almost believe them. Yeah, it's been ten times worse since that statement. Something very good will come to you. <laughs> it did. Every chunk was and coolie labor. Yeah, oh, well. It's no use griping. <clears throat> Whatever we do when we leave here, life will seem like one long holiday. The very latest idea is for us to unload and carry sacks of rice into the camp when the ration comes while natives sit around smoking straws, watching and laughing at us. One day last week, we had to unload a truck full of rice and store it in a Jap garage nearby. There were 50 heavy sacks. How the nips do loathe us. And they get so mad when we chat brightly and organise a system to make the job easier. A Scottish woman was called out to the centre of the camp today by a guard. You, Britisher, come here. Are you referring to me? Yes, Doc. You, come here. So is that a nice way to speak? A mere dog. Come here when I say. Will? You are to be beaten. Beaten? What for? What have I done? I judge what you've done and when you'll be beaten. This is how we treat... Don't stop! Stop, I tell you. Eh? You wait a minute until I remove my glasses and my dentures. Oh? Eh? No. <laughs> you know, what do you make of that? Scotty, that was priceless. Well, did you see that, Sister Jeff? Now, what do you make of it? First, he wants to hit me for no good reason. And then when I prepare myself, <laughs> he laughs in my face and walks away. Oh, there's no understanding them. <laughs> it certainly isn't. There's no sense in anything they do. Oh, but that performance was beautiful to watch. I must go and tell the others. <laughs> oh, I wonder what poor old Scotty had done. He was going to beat her up. Oh, nothing at all, probably. They don't even need an excuse nowadays to haul off and sock him. <laughs> Girls, quick. A fire flew over the fence from the Jap car. What? Oh. There's a man rush to get it. Come and help. Oh, Chop for oh, dinner. Come on. Wonderful. Oh, I've got it. Here it is. Oh, oh look oh. at that. It's a real Palembang model. Oh, let's have a look. <laughs> oh, the poor unfortunate thing looks most astonished. Mm, thin, too. Not too thin to eat. <laughs> but, but Margot, do you think we should keep it or, or, or should we put it back over the fence? 
Well, after all, it does belong to the guards. Listen, Woody, they owe us one skinny chook, if nothing else. The thing is, can we cook it without the smell going over the whole of the camp? There'll, there'll only be enough of the poor thing for us Australians and you English sisters, Margaret. If the worst comes to the worst, we'll set a guard around it while it's cooking. <laughs> oh, good heavens. What's the matter? Oh, the poor thing. It's closed its eyes and gone limp in my hands. I think I've killed it. Oh. Well, you couldn't have. You didn't do anything to it. I might have frightened it to death. But if you could see your face, Margot, it's a study. Hey, don't let it go. <laughs> oh. Oh. oh, oh, it's got away, the wily old brute. It was playing possum. Quick, block it. It's gone Shoot. under the bed. Oh. It's showing up your way, Jeff. Oh, you missed it. Shoot. Look out, Margot. It's heading for the door. Shoot. 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 Hey, chase it down this way. I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. You won't get away from me, my friend. (sighs) Let there be no further delay. The cauldron immediately. (laughs) Before it knew what had happened to it, the chook was killed, de-feathered and into the pot. That night, the English and Australian sisters had chicken soup and stew for dinner. It was very good, and we went to bed with quite full tummies. Lately, one of the mainstays of our diet has been banana skin curry. When it's cooked, it's bright purple. It hasn't much taste, but it is quite filling. But that, too, is to be stopped. Well, kids, all the bananas are to be stopped out of the rations. Oh, why, Woody? One of the Jap's girlfriends told the Jap rations officer that we were giving her curried banana skins in the community cookbook. Oh, she's lucky there's no ground glass lying around or she'd have a dollop of that all to herself. Yes, instead of just not eating it herself, if she doesn't like it, she's made a complaint. So now we don't get any bananas. Oh, we continue to go without the main essentials in an ordinary diet, I don't know. It must be made of cast iron. And all the same, don't forget there are always about 30 people in the camp hospital and about 50 ill in the blocks. Well, I wouldn't say any of us were pictures of health, but we're still on our feet. We just live from day to day. Nobody bothers about what will happen next week. Why worry? We can't do anything about it. A new guard has arrived to join us. Shorty has called him Rasputin, and he's definitely turning on the agony. We haven't had any rain for over a month, and all the wells are dry. The tap is allowed to trickle for a couple of hours each day, and nearly 600 women and children have to be bathed, fed, watered, and clothes washed. But more important, says Rasputin, are the sweet potatoes which we planted in the middle of the camp a while ago. They must be watered. What are they at now? Calling us out at this time. The natives are asleep. What? The hottest hour of the day, when everybody's asleep or resting, we're called out to Tenko. Mm, that's the Japanese Tenko. mentality for you. Oh. Come on, everyone. Let's get it over. <laughs> oh, for goodness sake, Rasputin, get on with it. I've been here for half an hour now. Look at him standing over there watching us. Oh, Smile, girls, don't wilt. (laughs) When it pleases his highness to come and speak to us, he'll probably find a little shriveled chip where I'm standing. Well, not this time, dear. He's on his way over now. Attention! No talking. I'll put a sock in it. You are to go to the pump and carry water back to the camp. You take buckets and not spirit. Be back here in five minutes. Ready to leave. Where are we to go? To a pump for water, Blanche. Taking with us buckets. Well, I hope it has some water in it. The pump, I mean. 
psyche at the well act is no good unless there's some water in it. Buckets? Says, where on earth are we going to get buckets? Well, there are some in the camp. And poles to carry them, if we can borrow them. And just grab anything else you can lay your hands on which will hold water. Mm, all right, I'll grab the tin hat. I'll see you in a minute. We all assembled with very odd utensils and started off. It's a long walk to the back gate of the camp. From there, we went into a street full of Jap houses and eventually got to the main road where we lived for two months early in 1942. Then, down a hill and along a very stony road we trudged. In all the heat, clanking and jangling like a gypsy caravan. If we go much further, we'll strike Darwin. Oh, if only we could. Mm. So far, you know, really, I suppose it's only about half a mile. It feels like ten miles. Yes. Oh, all oh, these <coughs> stones cut your feet. Yes, I know, and bruise oh. them. Well, oh, our goal is in sight. There before us is the pump. <gasps> well, thank heavens for that. Pump's right. Look at the poor unfortunate thing. Oh, and look at the mud and filth we've got to wade through to get to it. Now, look, we'd better organize a queue, otherwise there'll be a pandemonium. I'd like to stand under that and pump water over me and cool yes. off. There's no hope of that, Blanche. Come on, let's get cracking. Trust nurses. We had everyone lined up in no time, and two of our people stood by the pump to keep law and order. Then... Back up the stony hill, along the streets, and into the camp. To be met by Rasputin. Water carriers, over here! Water carriers, <coughs> over here! Well, this is one thing about us. We're varied over in here. our profession. Over here, water carriers. Gardeners, garbage men, and now water, now, water carriers. carriers. What does he want us to take the water into the middle of the camp for? Patience, it will all be made clear. Oh, I'll be glad to get this down. It's heavy. Oh, that's better. Now, water, potatoes. What? Oh, no. I thought this was for us to use. You hear me? Water, potatoes. But we need water desperately. Obey orders. Uh, Water potatoes. Hurry! There is much water to be carried today. I hate to think how many trips we made and continue to make every day for those cursed potatoes. If only we had some protection for our feet. We can manage at odd times to get a little dirty water from one well. And we asked Rasputin and Ito if we could change it for the clean water which we were carrying, put the well water on the potatoes and have clean water ourselves. The answer? Absolutely no. Yesterday we were told a very high Japanese official was coming and we must clean up the camp. Old sheds had to come down, kitchens had to be tidied, the drains in the street cleaned. Also, we had to cut the long grass on the roadside and in the Jap gardens. Oh, well, it's all very well to tell us to cut the grass, but what with? If there were more time, we could get down on all fours and crop it like horses. I'm sure it's very nourishing. Hey, girls, here comes Looney the Dill. Oh. <laughs> well, look what he's got. Oh. A lawnmower. Oh. That's what it is. Oh, come on, Stray. Hey, Rupert Patongi. What was that cut. little speech? You cut. Hmm? He says, here's a grass cutter. Cut the grass. Um, Sire Jungan Tau Bagimana. Oh. Uh, Sire Tunjuk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tunjuk. Tunjuk. I, I, I show. See that. Tita, uh, Apama. Who? Listen to Jess, Blanche. 
Hey. Pretending she doesn't know what a lawnmower hey, is. Doesn't know how to use it. Uh, uh, summer, summer. Summer, summer. Oh, hey. Come oh. Come on, back in. Yo, 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 cut. Saya Chuba. Ah, ah, ah. Bagos, Bagos. Patong, Rupert, yo, cut. Taste your prices. Why all that palaver? Wait till he gets down the road, please. I'll show you. Jeff, see if you can find a little bit of stick or stone or something. What are you going to do, Jess? Block the mower. Well, here's some nice long grass. Will this do? Yes, the very thing. Now, look, put it in here. Wind it round so. Mm. There, Bob's your uncle. Well, now what do we do? Sit in the shade and wait for Luna to come back. Then we'll tell him that the mower is sick and let him fix it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a wonderful idea. Oh, oh, this is the life. When Looney the Dill came back, we told him the lawnmower wouldn't work. He set to and unstuck it and mowed two more strips to show us how easy it was, then handed it back to us. As soon as he was out of sight, Jess blocked it again. This went on until poor old Looney cut the whole lawn and hadn't realized he'd done it. Our next chore was not so pleasant. You, five Osteries, clean up storehouse. When that is finished, you clean out septic tanks and empty contents on sweet potatoes. Hurry! You, clean frack smuts off fridge roof. You, others, sweet well, now, I sincerely trust we never ask to eat the sweet potatoes. If we're smart, we might be able to spill a little rice when we clean up the storehouse. Mm. We'd better take a tin with us, then. Well, come on. Let's get on with it. Gosh, it's good to sit down. What a day. Oh, the high official must be a very high official. <coughs> I hope he's worth it. I have yet to see the jet that is worth five seconds of the chores we've had today. Oh, those sweet potatoes. Yes. The only bright spot was Jess's little trick with Looney the Dill. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello, kid. Oh, what's the matter, Jess? I've just come over from the hospital. You know that little English girl, Molly? Yes. She collapsed in the kitchen the other day. She died a few minutes ago. What? Oh, no. But, but she can't have. She was only a kid in her twenties. She was one of the healthiest people here. Yes, I know. Oh, well, there it is. She was such a darling. It's all so damned useless. Molly had been a member of the Coral Society and had a very lovely voice. It didn't seem possible that we wouldn't hear it again. She'd made us forget our dreary surroundings so often with her singing, and every one of us will miss her very much. The high official duly arrived this morning, and Rasputin and the guards were in a complete dither. He's certainly the most important one we've had so far. I wonder who he can be. I don't know, Blanche, but he's smothered in red and gold. <laughs> Have you ever seen such an enormous sword, that little wart? I like the touch about not being allowed to speak to him. As if anybody would want to. Oh, all that fuss and bother for two days, breaking our backs. Then he struts around for five minutes and leaves. I know, I can't imagine what it was all in aid of. Oh, well, another day, another inspection. But I would have liked to lend of his car for an hour or so. It was very beautiful, but it wouldn't have got us all back home. And that's the only thing I'm interested in. After lunch, Siki the saddest 
wasted one and a half hours making another speech to us in Japanese. We still haven't a clue as to what he was saying. Two people apparently did understand, and when I asked one of them what it was all about, she said, Oh, it was nothing. What a waste of time. again for a further episode of this true story of Australian women at war. White Coolies is based on the diary written secretly in a Japanese prison camp by Sister Betty Jeffrey, especially adapted for radio by Gwen Friend, and produced by Fifi Banvard for Australasian Radio Productions.